where the former Shadow Foreign Secretary Hillary Benn was sitting here, having been fired in the middle of the night by Jeremy Corbyn. That provoked a deluge of resignations from the Shadow Cabinet and a crisis for the Labour leader unprecedented in British politics. Since then, Mr Corbyn hasn't done a major interview, but this weekend, Angela Eagle has announced her formal challenge to him and a brutal knock-down fight for the soul and perhaps the future of the Labour Party starts here. Jeremy Corbyn, welcome. Um, now, all this started with um, reaction to the Brexit vote. So a very, very straightforward question, if I may, to start with. Which way did you vote in that referendum yourself? Remain. I'm surprised you even asked the question. Well, I, I asked it because quite a lot of people around you suggested that you had never been a supporter. Nobody ever suggested I was going to do anything other than vote Remain, and I think you're very well aware of that. Did you do everything you possibly could have done, do you think, to win that for Listen, the Remain side? I worked flat out. I travelled the whole country. I addressed union conferences, street meetings, public meetings, mm. universities, colleges, lots of places, urging people to vote Remain because of the general direction this country would go if we voted to leave. I'm not uncritical of the European Union, as everybody knows, and indeed the most of the population are not uncritical of the European Union. And I've been reaching out. Yesterday, I came back from Paris, where I'd been, um, Friday rather, where I'd been meeting the Party of European Socialists to work together with socialist parties, in some cases governments across Europe, on how we deal with this and what access we have to the single market in the future and protect the social conditions that we have got through the social chapter in the treaty. Angela Eagle has now announced that she is going to stand against you. Have you any message for her this weekend? Well, I'm disappointed, but obviously she's free to do that if she wishes to. We have worked together in the past six months, or nine months actually, in the Shadow Cabinet, and this is an opportunity when we could be putting enormous pressure on this Tory government, on inequality and injustice, in pov on pov poverty, and all the issues this Tory government is... Would you doing like her at the 11th hour to think again in that case? Well, she resigned from the Shadow Cabinet. Uh, we had a conversation after she had announced her resignation from the Shadow Cabinet, and uh, I would ask her to think for a moment. This is the opportunity of the party to unite mm -hmm. against what the Tories are doing, to put forward an agenda which is different to the austerity agenda being put forward mm -hmm. by the Tories, and actually gain a lot of ground. We now have a very large membership. Over half a million people are members of our party. Yeah. They've joined for a reason, and they want to see a party that is active all the time yeah. opposing what this government's doing. If she does stand, <coughs> are you confident you can get the 51 nominations you need to be on the ballot for the next leadership? I'm expecting process? to be on the ballot paper because the rules of the party indicate that the existing leader, if challenged, should be on the ballot paper anyway. But the uh, legal advice that's been taken by the party says that you do need those nominations, as Neil Kinnock had to get them when he was challenged. That was, uh, Neil should remind himself, that was in 1988 when the election of leader was done by an electoral college system. That has long since been abolished. We now have a one member, one vote system. The rules, in my view, are absolutely clear. And indeed, I'm not sure what this legal advice is referring to. I have not been shown any legal advice to that effect. Have you taken legal advice of your own? I've taken much um, soundings from lawyers. There's a lot of lawyers about, you know. There are a lot of lawyers. And what do the lawyers tell you? That you, you will stand, <coughs> you'll be on the ballot yes. come what may? Yes, indeed, sir. Um, some people say, why should you be treated differently? I mean, Neil Kinnock had to get the, those numbers of people. In the past, Labour leaders have had to show that they have the support of a sizable number, actually just a fifth of the MPs and the MEPs. Why should you be different? That was in 1988. The Electoral College system has since been abolished. We now have a one-member, one-vote system. Mm -hmm. And uh, members of Parliament have a role in that. Of course they do. But at the end of the day, the final say is by the members, affiliates and supporters of the party. But if you had to, do you think you could get those 50, 51 nominations? You'd be surprised how much support there is out there. of People that feel that uh, I was elected a year ago mm. with a very large majority and a very large mandate and since then we've defeated the government on more than right. 20 occasions in Parliament. We've won elections. I think we're a party that's going places and doing very well actually. This is uh, something that's going to end <coughs> up with the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party, the NEC, this week. If the NEC decides that you should not be on the ballot paper without getting those nominations, will you take that to court? I will challenge that if that is the view they take, but I would also in just... Court. Oh, wait a can I finish? Yeah. I would just ask anyone in the party to think for a moment. Is it really right that the members of the party should be denied a decision, a discussion, a choice in this? Half a million people are members of the party because they want the party to succeed. Surely they are the people 
that knock on doors. They're the people that deliver leaflets. They're the people that raise the money. But as Neil Kinnock has said, in the end, the Labour Party is a parliamentary party. Its founding constitution is to create and sustain a party in Parliament. And if you have not got the support of 80% of your own MPs, it's very hard to see how you can be an effective leader in opposition or perhaps one day in government. Well, Neil says that, and I heard him say that, and indeed I've heard him say it on, on a number of occasions. The reality is the party is a coalition of affiliated unions, social societies, individual members, registered supporters, and members of parliament. They have to come together. I have reached out in a way that no other leader ever has in the breadth of the political views of people I brought round the shadow cabinet table. I'm not the one who's been trying to box sure. myself into a corner. But, I've reached out in, in the most in the broadest way I could. Let's go back to how this all started, which was that very dramatic night when um, Hilary Benn was fired by you in the middle of the night. What's happened and why did you fire him? Well, <clears throat> Hilary confirmed to me in a phone call that he had indeed been collecting signatures for some days of um, wanting to have a mass resignation from the shadow cabinet because he didn't agree with my leadership. <clears throat> I didn't think that was a particularly collegiate thing to do, particularly as we were actually involved in the EU referendum campaign at that time. I was the one who was travelling the country getting support for a Remain vote and uh, he confirmed he'd been doing that and uh, we then discussed it and he generously, as I generously said to him, said, well look, this really can't go on and so we parted company. Well, you're two courteous people. and you oh, we're that very courteous. Parted, parted we both come from very courteous families. You, you parted company courteously, but after that, 63 members of your team resigned, leaving you with a very kind of threadbare shadow cabinet, if I may say so. There are lots of important jobs you can't even fill, and people doing more than one job. This is not really an effective opposition in the traditional way, is it? I'm saying to Labour MPs, you have a responsibility to represent the party in Parliament. We're only any of us in Parliament because of the work of Labour Party members and supporters and of course Labour voters and uh, I urge them to recognise that but also I'm keen to reach out. We're going to come together discussing how we deal with the possible UK um, negotiations over the next few months over the European Union. Mm. There's an awful lot of policy areas where there's a great deal of agreement but I think the crucial one is the achievement of John McDonnell in turning economic policy around so that pretty well everybody seems to be now signed up to the idea you invest rather than cut in order to to grow our economy. But you haven't got a proper shadow Europe minister at the moment. You've got one, the same person is doing the shadow Welsh job and the Northern, sorry, the Northern Irish job and the Scottish job and he's English. I mean, this is going to be very, very hard for the Labour Party to do the serious line by line criticism and opposition and holding the government to account that it ought to be doing. <coughs> That's why I say to Labour MPs, get round the table, get together, so that we can do the line-by-line -line criticism of what this government is doing. And I have to say this, that there are very many talented people in the Parliamentary Labour Party, and I'm dis disappointed that some of them have declined to take on yes. positions that have been offered. I ask them to think again about this, because our duty is to stand up for the very poorest and most vulnerable people in the society and convince the majority that a better society is one that's inclusive to all. The hard truth is that they have lost faith in you personally. And it's not just the Blairites, it's not just the right, it's people like Lisa Nandy, Ed Miliband, who was a great, great supporter all the way through, eventually said, it's not working, it's over. And well, th th these are people who are supposed to be on your side. They have said that MPs control everything in the end of the day and decide what we do or not. I just ask them to think for a moment about the very large number of members of this party and people who've joined our party in order to try and create a better society in Britain. Don't they have a right to have a say in all of this? Don't they have a voice that should be heard in all of this? And I reach out and I'm mm. quite prepared to work with people. I was given sure. a huge responsibility and a mandate a year ago and I'm carrying it out. But those MPs have the votes of nine million British people behind them as well. Um, I mean, here is Louise Hay, who voted for you in the leadership campaign. She said, I completely respect the mandate Jeremy has from the membership, as you've been talking about, but in order to lead Labour in Westminster, he has to have a parliamentary mandate too, and you don't. 
um, or Lisa Nandy. The lack of confidence in the leadership goes beyond the small group of MPs who have consistently opposed Jeremy since his election. It has become clear that he is unable to form a broad, inclusive shadow cabinet that draws on the best of our movement's traditions. Then why doesn't Lisa come back into the shadow cabinet? Why did you feel she feel it necessary? She doesn't have faith in you. A week ago, she was happily in the shadow cabinet. Two hours later, she decided she wasn't. I've noticed the enormous pressure that's been put, and uh, MPs have told me about this, by a group saying, you've got to get out of that. You've got to leave Corbyn alone. You've got to get away from him. Sorry, we have a Labour Party. Labour MPs have, I think, a responsibility to represent our party. And I urge them to think again about what they're doing at the present time. Surely, the Tory party is in disarray. Unemployment is rising, inflation is rising, the pound is falling, sure. jobs are closing. This is not Places the time for the Labour Party to be in disarray. Absolutely. This is the time when we should be out there doing that campaigning on an economic strategy, but very ably put forward by John McDonnell, which does prevent, present a real opportunity mm. and a real alternative for the people of this country. But people like Lisa Nandy are grown-ups and now quite experienced politicians. They have taken their decision for their own reasons. And the, it remains the problem that you do not have a majority of Labour MPs, nothing like it in the Commons behind you. So one of two things can happen. Either you could decide something to stand aside and end that particular the problem that way, or eventually you have to get rid of those MPs who oppose you. You have to have it's, mandatory reselections and get them all out, get 80% um, of Labour MPs out. It's a democratic party, not a dictatorship. I was elected by a very large majority of members and supporters. I did not have a majority of MPs supporting me at the very beginning. I haven't enjoyed that position uh, during the past nine months of leadership. I have reached out to all sections of the parliamentary party and I would respectfully suggest that a little bit of movement to help us develop policies and campaign against this government ought to be our priority at the moment. So what's the movement coming from you? I mean, there have been talks and negotiations and so forth. What have you been offering the bring, rebels? Bring people together and decide how we deal with the very complex matter of the results of the referendum vote, the effects on industry and investment mm. and trade in this country, and the effects on uh, environmental, human rights and social policies in Britain. It, it, huge effects. But when they say this is really about Jeremy Corbyn, we don't have faith in Jeremy Corbyn and the way he is running the Labour Party and his office and its competence, that kind of answer isn't going to satisfy them, is it? Come and talk about it. I've reached out to Labour MPs in a way that very few other leaders have. I meet them frequently, one-to-one -one conversations you've talked, with many colleagues. You've talked to them, but you haven't actually done anything about it. I mean, you haven't put how a... Do you, how do you know what I've done or not done about well, it? Well, I'm asking you. I mean, if you can tell me that you have done something specific to meet their concerns, to either change your operation or say, I'm going to time limit my leadership, or if it's not working by a certain time, I'm going to stand aside. I mean, those well, kind of things. Why should I time limit a leadership when I've been elected by a very large number of members and mm. supporters in order to lead this party. Um, if, at the end of the day, an election somewhere mm. results in a different leader, so be it. But I would be irresponsible if I walked away from a mandate that I was given and a responsibility I was given. I ask colleagues to respect that as well. You have been under enormous personal pressure. You must have talked about this with your family. And there was talk that there was a period when you did have a bit of a wobble. You thought, is it really worth it? Can I carry on personally doing Andrew, this? Andrew, you read too many newspapers. You it's really do. It's all I do. It's all you do, read newspapers. Well, yeah, can I tell you something? There's no wobbles. is it true? There's, no, absolutely untrue. Mm. There's mm. no wobbles. There's no stress. There's no depression. I'll tell you what real stress is. Real stress is when you can't feed your kids. Real stress is if you don't know you've got a job next day. Real stress is if your landlord is going to evict you from your home. Mm. That's what real stress in our society is. Our job, our job as politicians, as public representatives, yeah. is to recognise the real stresses people face in society and, and try and bring about a society that deals absolutely. with those issues. And you can only deal with that if you win power as a party. Yes. And if 80% of your own MPs think that they can't do that under you, isn't part of the fault Jeremy Corbyn's fault? He can't all be your enemies, all, all them and nothing to do with me. Surely some of it is to do with no, you. I'm quite prepared to believe that everything goes wrong is my fault. Everything that's successful is somebody else's achievement. That's fine. That's what leadership's about. About. But I just say this, we've defeated the government on 20 occasions, 22 occasions. We've won parliamentary by-elections with a, a swings to Labour. We've increased our vote in local elections. Mm -hmm. We've won four mayoral contexts. There's a th three million families who are a thousand pounds a year better off 
because of the Labour opposition to the cuts in working tax credits. Every person in receipt of personal independence payments continues to get them because of Labour opposition. The forced academisation of schools is not happening because of Labour opposition. There's quite a lot that we've achieved in the past nine months we can be very proud of. Your MPs clearly don't completely agree with that. But can I ask you about well, another, another, another criticism? they voted with me on those issues. An another thing they say, about, they did, but um, it's, again, it's the leadership question. And people say to me, how can it be that, you know, Tony Blair, much reviled today, but nonetheless, he won a huge, huge uh, landslide victory in the Labour leadership election to begin with. Then he won another landslide victory in the country. He had all those votes behind him. And you voted against him 500 times. How can you then turn round to the Labour Party and say, give me the loyalty that I never gave to Tony Blair? I never attacked Tony Blair personally. And I no, don't but you do voted that. against oh, no, And I, I voted on issues of the Iraq war, on issues of the conduct of anti-terrorism, and issues such as student fees and student loans, a number of issues, yes, of course I did, over quite a long period. I also so vo very happily, government. very happily and very proudly voted to bring in the National Minimum Wage, to mm. bring in the Human Rights Act, to bring in, under Gordon Brown, the Equalities Act. And so, yes, and, again, and also... Sorry, Neil, Neil, Neil Kinnock had a big mandate too, and you were part of the campaign to topple him. How can you turn around and talk to people and say, I want, I want your loyalty, the loyalty that I did not give we to Kinnock or Blair? There was a challenge let, uh, that Terry mm. Venn made to Neil Kinnock in 1988. It was unsuccessful. Mm. We then carried on working, to, working in the party to try and win the mm. 1992 election, which sadly was not to be. Is the victory of the left inside the Labour Party more important than winning the next general election? What's most important is to change the way politics is done in this country, to incite young people and older people into the idea that you can have a society that doesn't divide people, that doesn't have grotesque levels of inequality, and we don't make the younger generation worse off than this generation and their children worse off than us. It's a way of doing politics that has changed, partly engendered by social media, partly mm. by social movements across Europe and North America. The times are changing, and the last people to understand that seem to be uh, many of our media leader writers. If I, well, if I may be so bold. You mentioned social media, and this has all been very genial, but the volumes of abuse being hurled at your opponents on the social media by people who say that they're your supporters is now pretty vile and pretty horrible. I mean, I can read them out, but nobody, they're unpleasant. Nobody does vile abuse in my name with my approval, my support. I absolutely, totally condemn it in every way, uh, as just as much as any abuse that's hurled at me yes. or anybody else is simply wrong. I yeah. urge people to engage in political debate, not media abuse of any sort. So Rob J. Marshall, who says he's one of your supporters and describes Angela Eagle as you treacherous bitch, Julie Doran, who's even worse, um, talks about Angela Eagle, her Tory supporting weasels like Angela Eagle or her gang of selfish Blairites. Totally unacceptable language. I've, I've talked to lots of MPs um, who, are, who are opposed to you, who are now very worried that they are being forcibly deselected, that momentum are moving into their constituencies, taking over branches and then taking over CLPs and getting them out. The mood is very, very nasty out there. I've made it very clear that debate should be respectful, debate should be polite, debate should be political. And I have to say that um, much of the criticism that's levelled at me by members of Parliament, some of it very unpleasant and some of it very public, is almost never political never political. They don't say which particular policy it's I'm supporting. It's all very personal. I absolutely agree well, with which that. Which is, is surely a bit unfortunate, isn't it? Well, it is. I mean, it is also the case that Momentum has made you its cause. If you go onto the Momentum website, it doesn't say, we believe in this, that and the other. It doesn't give you a list of left or leftish policies. It says, we are here to support Jeremy Corbyn. And it's your name and your face all over it. So in a sense, you have personalised this. Well, or Momentum, you, is, you, momentum has, has been developed as a, a way of bringing people into politics, getting people motivated. Or backing and Jeremy Corbyn, really. Uh, yeah, many of them are supportive of what my leadership is trying to achieve in economic policy, in human rights policy, in foreign policy, all these areas. I hope we can come together and recognise that the solutions to okay. people's problems out there it's, are it, actually political. It seems unlikely. Um, is there any part of you that would prefer to split the Labour Party than stand down? Listen, I joined the Labour Party when I was 16. I've been in the Labour Party 
all my life, my family... See, Owen Smith everybody. says that you told him that you would prefer to split the Labour Party than stand aside. I've no idea why Owen should say such a thing. I th had a quite interesting, mm. almost philosophical political discussion with Owen a week ago. And I'm but you didn't say that? Absolutely not. I'm su slightly surprised he would right. go out and say that. But I'm happy to have a discussion with Owen any time okay. so we can discuss how we take things. Well, we work together two, two, on the steel industry and other issues and happy to do so again. Two other very, very big issues just coming up at the moment. <coughs> Not about Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, though in a sense they are. Um, the Trident vote is coming up. How will you whip your MPs? Well, I understand the vote is going to be solely on whether or not Britain has continuous at-sea deterrence. And I'm very surprised the government has put down a motion in that sense. If we as a parliament and the country vote to maintain permanent continuous at sea deterrence that actually takes away the any opportunity fulfilling our obligations under the nuclear non-proliferation treaty to reduce the number of vessels or warheads and it so actually will you takes tell away Labour MPs to vote that down um, we're going to have to have a discussion about it I recognize there are big differences of opinion on this my views are very well known on this the views of many others are very well known on this and so there may well be MPs voting in different lobbies, but the point I'll be making is that by maintaining, by a vote solely so, so on you're, this, you're it not actually, going to insist it, on a whip. It, it actually reduces right. the the opportunity for having uh, future disarmament talks. Surely we all want to live in a okay. nuclear free world. It was a Labour government, by the way, that right. uh, signed up to the Nuclear Non Proliferation Treaty. We're well, beyond, by the way, is because we've got less than half a minute left. You heard um, uh, David Davis talking about the Chilcot process and that there's going to be a motion of contempt in the House of Commons against Tony Blair for deceiving the House of Commons. How will you vote in that and what would you <coughs> urge Labour MPs I to I urge do? colleagues to read the Butler report and read the Chilcot report about the way in which Parliament was denied the information it should have had, the way in which there was lack of preparations for the post-invasion situation in Iraq and the way there were the assertions of weapons of mass destruction. Parliament must hold to account, including Tony Blair, those who took us into this particular and war. That is surely I, what I, a I parliamentary with, democracy is about. I started with about. a yes or no. Let me try and finish with a yes or no. So vote for the contempt motion, well, yes or no. I haven't seen it yet, but I think I probably would. All right. Jeremy Corbyn, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. That is nearly all that we've got time for. Thanks to all my